I'm still really sad about Tower of Nero. Hi, my name is Caitlin. I read a lot and welcome back to my channel. Without further ado, let's just begin. I have I have nine books to talk about today. Almost all of these were a five star read or a 4.5 out of 5. First book is an ebook actually. That is the All for the Game series by Nora Sakovic, but I reread it like two or three times in its entirety at the beginning of 2020. Absolutely loved it. I high key obsessed over it all throughout 2020. It's classified as like sports contemporary and as someone who's not an avid sports person, it's definitely out of my comfort zone for reading but it does read quite a bit like a contemporary. Honestly, it kind of reads like a Wattpad book but I mean that in the best way possible. Oh, and by the way, I'm going this in order of when I read it, not necessarily in my number one spot. So what this book is actually about is about Neil Justin, who is on the run from his past. past is catching up to him and he needs a way out and he gets signed on to this college. He gets onto the University State Exe team. And Exe is basically this made up sport that this author created, hockey and lacrosse. So I don't really know much about either, but I think by the end of the first book I really got a better grasp for the actual sport and that made it a lot more enjoyable to read because quite a couple of the chapters are set during the game and those are really focal points for the story and I really enjoyed it. The writing of this is really really good like I generally really enjoyed it some of but I think what I love the most and actually I think you'll see this um, in a pattern of all my favorite books in general but a lot of my favorite books are character driven. I am always an advocate for character driven books over plot driven books because you can have a crappy plot and make it enjoyable by having really good characters. And not to say that this book had a bad plot, it's just that the plot was a lot harder to follow and I wouldn't have gone through with it had it not been for the foxes, which is like the XC team that we meet. I really love them. Neil and Andrew are a great duo. Their dynamic, like seeing it evolve from the first book, up until the last book is really really well done and I love the topics that are discussed and I will say with this trilogy there are some major trigger warnings that you need to be aware of before you go into it. Uh, I probably should have mentioned that before but there are talks of abuse, uh, there's a lot of alcohol and drug usage, there's a lot of toxicity regarding some relationships. Addiction is also there. Uh, conversion therapy is mentioned. So definitely check the uh, trigger warnings because there's quite a few. And it is also an LGBTQ book which always makes things a little bit better. I would recommend you go into these books kind of blind. The way that I always pitch it is like murderous gay mafia. So. <laughs> I would say my favorite character is Andrew. He's a little bit problematic, but all of my favorite characters are. So we'll deal with it. The next book is Heartstopper by Alice Osman. Um, this is probably one of the first graphic novels I read that wasn't Marvel. I just want to like show the art style very quickly because it is so cute. Can you see that? Look how cute that is. I absolutely loved it. It, as you can see, is an LGBTQ graphic novel. It is about like coming out. It's about first love, high school romance. It's really pure. It's really fluffy. Towards the third book, I will say that there's a couple trigger warnings regarding eating disorders. And then I think in the second book, there's a couple trigger warnings for self harm and suicide maybe? I could be wrong. The really heavy topics are done in a way that it's very casual without taking away from the seriousness of the topic. And I just really love it. Nick and Charlie are great characters. 
they're they're so fun to read they're so cute and it's so wholesome they really deal with a lot of homophobia in the first book and they even touch on internalized homophobia which i think is really important <laughs> there is bisexual representation there is gay representation I'm pretty sure there's transgender representation, there's lesbian representation. I feel like I'm missing some other stuff. I think there might be pan as well, I could be wrong. This book series is like so gay. <laughs> That's Heartstopper, really loved it. I don't really need to say much else. I think my favorite book from the series, there's only three so far would be the first one. It pulled me in the most and Nick and Charlie stole my heart with it. The next book on my list is technically not one that I own, but I do have the second book. So this is A Heart So Fierce and Broken, but the first book is A Curse So Dark and Lonely and it is by Bridget Kemmerer and it is a retelling of Beauty and the Beast. When I say it's a retelling, I would actually kind of say that in a very loose sense because by the end of the story you kind of realize that like it's sure it draws parallels to the original story of Beauty and the Beast but A Curse So Dark and Lonely has taken its own shape and form and you can really distinguish the differences and I think those differences is what makes A Curse So Dark and Lonely such a good book. The characters, it's a very small cast, really only like two, three characters that we get to know. So in the first book, they end up being so well fleshed out and so well written. It's so good. I'm just, I'm telling you now, it is so good. I highly recommend. Harper is such a great main character. I really love her and she doesn't fit the damsel in distress role. Not, not that Belle did either from Beauty and the Beast, but... I really love her as a main character. She's got a lot of grit. I say this a lot with my favorite main characters, especially for females, because a lot of the times female characters will be written really, really well. And like, as I say, like they have a lot of grit, they have a lot of rawness and determination and a lot of humanity and humility, but then they'll lose a lot of their typically feminine traits and I've been coming to realize this in media that like the ideal female is masculine like she has um, all almost all masculine traits and completely disregards the feminine traits but I think that the better written char female characters are ones that have a balance of both like you can be strong as a hero as a female hero while still maintaining emotions like it, it's really not that big of a, a big deal for a, a female to show emotions like it's not going to break you and it's not going to make you weak it's not going to make you any less of a human being than a male it wouldn't be a caitlin reads a lot video if my camera didn't cut out not me realizing while editing that my entire footage regarding Chain of Gold was just cut off. That's great. I like the book. Can I just say that and we can move on? It's a great book. Just read it. Can I say that? <laughs> you don't need to read the other books in the Shadowhunter Chronicles to read Chain of Gold. However, you will encounter spoilers from the Infernal Devices. So if you are going to read something before it, I would recommend Infernal Devices, but I feel like Chain of Gold it does a really good job at standing on its own as a book. Some of my favorite parts of Chain of Gold were the characters that we get to see. Cordelia is probably my favorite main character that we've seen Cassandra Clare write. She's probably the most well fleshed out and I just love her character so much. I love the way that she interacts with people. Honestly, I just I love her and I love her relationship with Lucy and the Merry Thieves and I also love her relationship with Alistair. It's so wholesome. It's amazing. The Chain of Gold characters are my favorite cast of characters ever that Cassandra Clare has written. Like I think the reason why Chain of Gold is such a good book is because these characters really make everything work so well. Like you come for the plot but like you stay for the characters like that type of thing and I think with Chain of Gold specifically 
the way that the plot comes back down to shadow hunters being shadow hunters and fighting demons is what makes it so good and it comes back to the roots of what the shadow hunter world was built upon rather than the political drama that dark artifices and the mortal instruments kind of delved into not that there's anything wrong with that it's just those kind of make me think a little bit too much and sometimes you just want a really good paced um, action book and I think Cassandra Clare is doing a really great job at getting the pacing right for having action and then also sowing the seeds for uh, future conflict does that make sense if it doesn't make sense I'm sorry I'm not gonna film anymore. I'm so sick of this video. We're just gonna move on to Crescent City. Actually, no. It's called House of... It's actually called House of Earth and Blood. This book wrecked me. Sarah J Mass has, in recent times, we have been made aware of just how problematic some of her writing is. I have partook, partaken? I have been a part of that slander, but it still remains to be that I am still trash for liking some parts of her writing. And she is getting better, and this book is proof of that, actually. I think these characters are the most three-dimensional characters she's written. I remember when I first read it, I, like, finished the book, and then I was like, Okay. We're gonna reread it again and then i did i just i went right back to the beginning and then i went through all of that emotional turmoil all over again it was worth it now basically this is a adult fiction book so i will make that disclaimer that if you are under the age of honestly maybe 16 because if you've read sarah jms's work then you've probably been desensitized to her work so this Honestly, putting it quite simply, is quite tame in comparison to, like, Akatar, which I think is where things get quite explicit. What this book is actually about is Bryce Quinlan. She is half fey, 22-year-old, I think. So she is in that party phase. I wouldn't know. <laughs> I'm 19. I don't really do much with my life. But I would assume that that's kind of what people in their early 20s do. Basically, something traumatic happens to her, and her life is changed. She is broken almost irreparably. And then basically this book is just her trying to figure out who done it, who did it. It was really fun trying to solve the mystery along with Bryce because that was her two-perspective book. So we get Hunt, and then we also get... Bryce and seeing it from both sides and seeing them both try to work together to try and figure out who did this is really interesting. This world is super complex. I'll read it out. There are four houses. So there's the House of Earth and Blood, and this is for the shifters, humans, witches, ordinary animals, and many others to whom I can't say that, but it's C T H O N A. I'm not gonna even try to say that. As well as some chosen by Luna. Then there is the House of Sky and Breath, the Malachim, which is the angels, the Fae, the Elementals, Sprites, and those who are blessed by Solas, along with some favored by Luna. Next is the House of Many Waters, which is the River Spirits, the Myrrh, Water Beasts, Nymphs, Kelpies, Nox, and other watched over by Oginus. And then the last house is the House of Flame and Shadow, which is the Daemon Nakai, Reapers, Wraiths, Vampires, Drekki, Dragons, Necromancers, and many wicked and unnamed things that even Erd herself cannot see. Han is really cute. He's one of my favorite love interests that Sarah J Mess has created, but he's one of the less problematic ones, so I think he gets extra points for that. And he's like, he's, a he's an angel. He's a fallen angel. And don't we all love trying to fix fallen angels? I know I do. Okay, next book is a book that I've actually been putting off for a while because I wanted to wait until the last book came out. And that is The Tyrant's Tomb and Tower of Nero by Rick Riordan. I don't know if you guys noticed, 
but I'm a bit of a Percy Jackson fan. I started reading Percy Jackson when I was 13. I am now 19. That is... How many years is that? That is six years. I did count that on my fingers. That's six years of my life completely uh, consumed, controlled by Rick Riordan, by Percy Jackson. The obsession is real, the hyperfixation is real. These were the last two books in the Rick Riordan verse that I know of. I, I started reading Tyrant's Tomb uh, several days after Tower of Nero came out because I wanted to read them consecutively so that uh, it would be fresh in my brain. The memory is still fresh and it still haunts me and hurts me till this day. It's a lot. I went through a lot of emotional turmoil when reading this book. Basically the Trials of Apollo series is Apollo is punished by Zeus and he is he was turned back into a human so he needs to complete this quest in order to uh, gain his godhood back. And then these two books just basically finish up the trying to defeat the Triumvirate. I think I literally read like the first like two, three pages and I started bawling my eyes out. And I just don't think I ever stopped. Every time we were reintroduced to a character that we had seen previously in previous uh, series, I started crying because I was reminded that Rick Riordan is doing this because he's trying to tie up all of the loose ends. He's trying to finish off what he started and go out with a bang basically and, and I'm not ready for it to end. I'm gonna recount the moment I finished the series because it's a pivotal point in my life now because there is when Percy Jackson ended and then when I had Percy Jackson basically and I'm gonna start crying. I had the book with me and I was my mom was driving me home from work so I had a lot of time to read and then we got to the last chapter. I didn't realize it was the last chapter because there's a short story at the end of my copy. There's like there's this much left so I got into the like last chapter not knowing it was the last chapter so I wasn't mentally prepared to have my favorite childhood book series end on me and I sorry I'm just remembering it it was a lot I got to the part where Apollo is talking to Meg and there's this quote that he says I'm not gonna say it out loud oh my god I'm gonna start crying <laughs> but actually he says the sun will always come back and then the last page of that Rick Riordan has written, the last series in the Percy Jackson world, is basically Rick Riordan telling us that he will always be there for us. And we have been through all of Apollo's haikus and <laughs> all of the memories we have made with them. I'm gonna hurry up because I'm crying. <laughs> and he basically thanks us for coming along with the journey. Ugh, I have to read it out, I'm sorry, no, I have to. It's so important to me. I think when you grow up with something this significant and then your favorite author goes out of their way to thank the reader. The Percy Jackson series has always been so personal. It started off with Percy telling us a story and we've been with him since then, since look, I didn't want to be a half-blood. Being a half-blood gets you killed in many different ways. So if you feel something stirring inside of yourself um, and you find yourself in these pages, uh, put this book down immediately because once you know, then they'll know. My name is Percy Jackson, I'm 12 years old and up until a couple months ago, I was a student at the Academy School for Troubled Kids. Am I a troubled kid? Yeah, you could say that. It started with that. And it's ending now with Apollo telling us, So dear reader, we have come to the end of my trials. You have followed me through five volumes of adventures and six months of pain and suffering. By my reckoning, you have read 210 of my haiku. 
like Meg, you surely deserve such a reward. What would you accept? I am fresh out of unicorns. However, anytime you take aim and prepare to fire your best shot, anytime you seek to put your emotions into a song or poem, know that I am smiling on you. We are friends now. Call on me. I will be there for you. And I think that is a beautiful way to end a beautiful story and it hit every emotion that we needed to feel we knew it was ending we knew that this was going to be the last book but it actually felt like an ending because i feel like what rick riordan tended to do especially in magnus chase and in heroes of olympus he had very open endings I preferred the way Lost Olympian ended, where it was a set ending and it had the open end, but without it feeling unfinished, like it was still satisfying. And this was satisfying. People may disagree or whatever because it still had a potential for future, but that's what was so good about it. It left me feeling satisfied as a reader and as a huge fan of this series, and I don't didn't feel like it was unfinished. I feel like all of the ties were done up in a nice little bow. We were able to touch on almost all of the characters again and find out where they were going and where they are now and what is in store for them. I have two more books left to talk about and I'm gonna talk about them in quick succession because <gasps> I'm still really sad about Tower of Nero. The next book is a contemporary book and it is called Tweet Cute by Emma Lord and it is basically about Pepper and Jack. It is a really cute, fluffy romance. It's set in New York, and it's basically about these rivaling restaurants, sort of, and it comes about based off of one restaurant potentially copying the recipe from another restaurant and then they go on a bit of a twitter banter slash fight of sorts and there's that rivalry online and it has a lot of tension and then unbeknownst to them pepper and jack they both own the separate accounts um, belonging to the restaurants and also, unbeknownst to them, they know each other in real life. Um, they're kind of like arch enemies, sort of. It's kind of like Jack is the class clown and his favorite person to annoy and poke fun at is Pepper. Without it being a bullying scenario, it's uh, well-meaning and honestly by the end of it you realize how good of friends you guys are because you spend so much time talking with each other. And another level to that relationship that adds a lot of depth and tension is that these two are kind of falling in love with each other on another app. So Jack has coded or created an app that allows people to anonymously talk to each other. They're in high school, you know, they're preparing for college, they're working, there's a lot riding on these two. They're such great characters to read. They read like real teenagers, they were making stupid teenager mistakes and stupid teenager jokes. Uh, I can't tell you how much I love this book. This last book I will be talking about today is How the King of Elfame Learned to Hate Stories. This is an accompany book for the Folk of Air series by Holly Black. It follows Cardin, who is the um, the cool prince, basically. And if you have read the first series, and the first series, we only see Jude's perspective. And this is in Cardin's perspective, and Cardin is actually my favorite character from the series. Again, with the problematic favorite characters, but it's fine. But it isn't necessarily like a story that has plot. It's more so backstory and kind of, I would say like fables, kind of like it, it, there's a message with each short story. And so it reads a lot like that and it reads a lot like a fairy tale. I love Holly Black's writing and I love her characterization of her characters and her world. I generally really enjoyed it. I don't have much else to say or to critique. The artist really went well and beyond. Can you see that? like wow i love art in books i feel like that's something that we need to bring back i think that's all i have to say thank you all so much for watching this video i hope you guys are having a good 
day or whatever time you guys are watching this it is afternoon for me so have a good morning a good afternoon a good evening a good night and goodbye